Hey guys. I asked, I John, this was Colin's good? choice. This was Colin's choice of story. All right. Don't, don't, blame, would, don't blame me. All right. It was Colin's choice. I, before I do the synopsis, which I printed out, I'm going to say this was picked at random. A story picked at random, just just so that we all know. I, okay. I, I enjoyed it. So, <laughs> oh, well, this is gonna we're gonna have a good conversation. Then this is gonna be nice. Um, mm. Let me just do, let, let's tune everyone in um, who who hasn't read the story. Um, though I actually found out recently, quite a few of the people that do listen. Um, they find out what it is we're reading and they do read it before we have the discussion, which is really Great. nice. Very nice yeah. to know. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Don't so, this one, though. Don't bother. Eh? This one, yeah, don't bother. Yeah. Don't waste your fucking time. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't try and lead the witness. Right. Don't yeah. try and lead the witness on this one. All right. Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so we've got a worldly old sea captain has inherited a house from his doctor friend, cousin, person, uh, Luke. Uh, I keep calling it Platt, but I think that's your fault, Sean. Um, uh, from Luke, uh, his cousin, Dr. Luke Platt, and wife, Mrs. Mrs. Pratt. Um, and uh, he's inherited this house, and it comes complete with a screaming skull, which he actually talks about very early on in the story. Um, so he discovers this branding box that keeps this skull and it's always screaming at him at least once a night. And he's this whole thing is told in a monologue where he is speaking to an unknown person that is a friend of his from his sailing days. And he muses about the way that he may have been responsible for the for Mrs. Pratt's death or may not have been responsible. He doesn't really want to know. But he has found that the skull itself rattles. And, our, and he's already told the story about how some woman in Ireland had killed three husbands by pouring lead into their ears. And he feels that this may have been the way that Dr. Pratt took his wife out. But he can't confirm that. He just has to tell the story three or four times first before we get to that kind of point. So his friend hears the screaming skull. There's a storm going on outside. There's all sorts of uh, telling of the story and not being nervous or imaginative at all until he is nervous and imaginative. And it, it continue goes with the mystery of whether or not this is the wife and the discovery of the lower jaw. And then the idea that it may have bit him whilst he was looking at it. So he's constantly building this picture whilst getting drunk with his friend of whether or not this skull is definitely screaming and whether it's biting him or not to the point when the window blows open, they open the box. There's nothing in the box. And he's now, oh, my God, the skull's outside and it wants to get back in. So they do what anyone would do. And they open the door to let the skull back in, which it does. It slides across the floor. And then as his mate tries to pick it up, it bites him on the hand and draws blood. And then they get it back into the actual box itself. I'm not going back in the box. You're going back in the box. And they get it back into the box. And then once it's in there, um, they go to sleep. And then there's a newspaper report that this here captain has died by being by, by the hands or teeth of assailant unknown, which strangely enough is exactly how the doctor, Dr. Luke Pratt, died in, a, in similar circumstances with the skull next to him as well. Um, I know that's all about the place, but that's basically how I saw the story. Yeah, that's kind of how it went. <laughs> All right. So let's go through this thing. Sean, hold yes. it, Ash. Hold it in. Yeah. Sean, what did you think yeah. of the story? I I really enjoyed it. Um, I mean, it was full of repetition. Uh, you know, oh, uh, you know, I won't mention it again, and then he mentions it again. Uh, <laughs> but I guess if you're going to write that kind of style, and you're going to write repetition, then there's going to have to be a style about it. Uh, and although there is repetition, I thought he timed the repeatings of everything quite well. Uh, and uh, and of course, it was his anxiety. And then, of course, for me, that style builds up the readers or the listeners, in my case. Uh, I, I listened to the audio book and I'm glad I listened to the audio book because to read it might have been a bit repetitious. Uh, but with the different tones in voice with the audio, it just it, it kind of. I think it's there just to build up your uh, anxiety too. And uh, and it did. And at the end, I, I guess I kind of guessed that something uh, macabre was going to happen. And it did in, to some tune. Uh, yeah, that's it. That it certainly did. Yeah. 
OK, let's get an opposite opinion of this. Ash. <laughs> um, it's not actually an opposite opinion. I completely agree with what Sean's just said there. Audiobook format is perfect for this because mm. the way that it's narrated in first person and there's that direct address to somebody who might be another character in the story, might be the audience. I can imagine that when this was first published in 1908, the idea was that you would... Um, that the and this is going to sound like I'm a sexist prick, but I don't care, the father of the household would get his copy of the magazine and sit down and read this to the rest of the family, and you would sort of like be entertained by the whole idea of this story being read aloud, because it's one that is meant to be read aloud. It's not one that you meant to sort of like take dry from the page, is it? Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think those are things that are in its favour, but if you just look at it as a piece of text... Um, it was just, for me, it was unreadable fucking waffle. It was just, I didn't know what the what the hell was going on. It was sort of like, start off in one direction, there's somebody's head, there's a bloke called Luke, um, there's another bloke called Luke, maybe, somebody's cousin, there's a head rolling up the beach. I didn't know what the hell was going on there. I felt like I was having an episode, and I was on either too much meds or not enough. Um, yeah, it really, really boiled my pish to quote a Scottish friend of mine, yes. So so did you read it then, Ash? Um, I listened to it first right, uh, and then thought, I'm missing something here, and then read the text and, yeah, didn't get all the way through the text because oh. it just, yeah, it wasn't working for me as something. Uh, yeah, that I, I can see that, definitely. But, yeah. um, but as much as I was thinking in the middle, oh, you know, am I getting on with this? I think I did in the end, uh, you know. I don't, I don't think it, if we're making a uh, Premier League of uh, uh, of stories, then I don't think it's gonna, it will ever be at the top of our Premier League from our recent uh, uh, foreign. Oh, really? But nonetheless, yeah, it was okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that did worry me um, was that he seemed to be throwing every spooky damn thing that he could into the story with, oh, here's a screaming skull. Here's somebody who's been murdered. Here's something washed <laughs> up on the beach. Here's thunder and lightning. Oh, there's a... Yeah, and he was just, oh, <laughs> shovel some more shite on there, why don't you? Colin, I was sort of like, we're ignoring your opinion on this. Um, well, I I read it as opposed to hearing it. I tried listening to it, but I found two copies of the audiobook that made me want to kill the narrator. Mm. They were dreadful. They really, really were bad. Um, I think there's a great story underneath it that, and I think this is a, I think it's got a really good spooky story and it's about 2000 words too long. Mm. I um, think, it'd make, I think it'd make a great French and Saunders, uh, uh, parody. Absolutely. Fabulous. I mean, the way the skull slides in through the front yeah. door, I'd be like, I was just, that was so funny. It's just slide. It doesn't roll. Just slides in along the floor. Oh, I do. I do. I I was expecting to be gnashing like that, like one of those wind-up teeth. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's. I think it's got some nice elements to it. The repetition was a bit bad when you were reading it, and also I can understand why you might like it from your acting background, Sean, because it almost reads like a script. Mm. And when you've got all the bits when he's talking to the person in the room, mm. the way it's written doesn't actually give you the pauses that are needed. And when I try to listen to it, there's a couple of times when he's sort of talking to the person in the room and there's no wait for the person to answer back. Mm -hmm. And then there are moments as well where th this is where I was getting kind of annoyed with the writing of it in terms of some of the stuff that we've read where the writing quality is just immense. I can't say that the writing quality is immense on this one. Yeah. Moments when he was going, no, you're absolutely right. We should go upstairs with the lantern and have a look in the box and open the box up like this. And there were moments when it felt like it was a magic trick on stage, you know, and stuff like that. So there was a lot of real over explanation going on. Well, the one I listen, when you're reading it, the one I listened to, it was like his anxiety was talking to him and he was talking it out loud. So we've all been in situations where the brain thinks very, very quickly, quicker than you can speak. Yeah. Uh, way quicker than you can speak. But he was trying to keep up with that, what, what the brain was saying to him. And that's how, that's how I tuned into it. So, I, I, Like I say, if you get the right narrator to it, I can imagine it being delivered. That's the whole thing. I can imagine it's being delivered really well. And it's like something you said to me once about stage performances, is they are, they are half a second away from being either brilliant or rubbish. <laughs> well, yeah. no, comedy is, oh. you know, not yeah. well, comedy is, and also 
um, uh, like horror. Horror, horror is as well. Horror and comedy. Yeah. Two sides of the same thing. They, they work with the same mechanic. Mm. And, and with this one, there were just moments of it where I'll go when he gets the box, for example. That's the bit that's sticking in my head. And he's doing this whole thing where he's going, and look, there's the seal. Can you see it? The seal is unbroken. And it was almost like a Darren Brown illusion, the way he kept on creating the evidence and making sure the person had seen it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but he was what... talking to himself. He was trying to convince himself. Yeah, I mean, if you, I never even thought, because when you read it, he's talking to someone else. Yeah. that's And so when if there's someone else in the room, and yeah. that's what I mean, it's that little subtlety. It, the yeah. way that you've got it, of him talking to himself and he's going a bit nuts, a bit kind of like for yeah. the House of Usher, say. Yeah. It has a different context about it. It feels more like a nutty piece at that point. Mm. But it, there's, there's always evidence, like it bites his mate's fingers, not his fingers, and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and once you put somebody else in the room, you're almost going, God, will you just let the other man speak? Because <laughs> it's like an hour of him just going yeah, on. I I pictured him as like a, a, a Coronation Street extra who's sat been too long. The director's chosen uh, the wrong angle on the camera and he's still in shot, but he daren't speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always like that. That actually, it's not even a friend of his. It's just someone he's dragged in off the street and he's just like ranting at them and they're just, you know, too frightened to move. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose there's sort of like three ways that we can take um, that on um, that person that's been addressed. It could either be, yeah, like Sean says, it could be himself talking to himself and he's got his own anxieties that he's projecting there. It could be a, another character that we don't get to see who just, like Colin says, gets his fingers bitten occasionally by this um, stupid fucking school that's um, probably like that. <laughs> Or it could be that he's directly addressing the reader and we're meant to be sort of like brought into that and it's meant to be an interactive piece. Um, the part where he sort of like says, um, can you hear sort of like the wind outside, is it? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, if you hush and don't speak, you'll hear it now. And again, that's what made me think of sort of like some 1908 bloke sitting down with the family and sort of like saying, oh, and if you're all quiet, you can hear it now. And then sort of like a... <laughs> Or something, yeah, maybe not quite as subtle as that, but yeah. Um... As an interactive piece, I agree completely. I mean, it, it, there's a reason, must be a reason why it's in the top seven Halloween stories for The Guardian. Mm. And Halloween stories are ones that you read out. You know, they are something that you do as a group rather than sit there and read on your own. Yeah, I can, but, see, that. I can see that working completely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as a group activity, you can because it's got it's almost like going on a bear hunt, isn't it? When you do, like, say, with all those little triggers in it, can you see it? Can you see it's still sealed? Can you hear him on the stairs? You know, all that kind of stuff. It, it does, it does come across a little bit like that. But say, when you're on your own, just reading, it's not spooky on its own. Oh, no, I, I, I can't imagine trying to read it. I mean, we've all been there. I've certainly been there. I've been very unlucky in fiction, uh, you know, years ago when I've tried to delve into some great fiction. And it's like all oh, names, and it's like God. I'm only fifty pages in, and I've got about sixty names to remember. <laughs> like, who's, who's okayed this book? God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean things like Tolstoy. You sort of like there at the end of page one, and you're thinking, "This isn't a novel. This is a phone book." Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's nothing but bloody names there. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Tolstoy's A to Z. Yeah. 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 I mean, War and Peace is just, yeah, it's one, and the fact that there's sort of like really long Russian names as well. Um, yeah. That, I always thought that. it was called War and Peace because you gave it to everyone who was at war and it took them so long to read that there'd eventually be peace. <laughs> that would make sense, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've, I've seen it from afar and that's as, about as close as I'm going to get to that one. Well, you think you saw... If it was this big, you saw it from afar. If it was this big, then you saw mm. it from a middle distance. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not for me, I don't think. No. Although uh, the, the, the theory of uh, reading into someone's thoughts from way back then, that's, that, that sounds interesting, but not when it's like that and not, yeah. when, it's all, not when it's all Russian. No. <laughs> uh, that's why short stories work so much better, isn't it? Yes. Short stories, yeah, um, 
even if you sort of like get fed up with him, you can sort of like think, ah, oh, there's three more pages, screw it. Whereas, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing with this one, because it is a very difficult thing to read on the page. Yeah. But because I knew it was going to end sooner rather than later, I'm not putting it down. I have done that with books. I have, I mean, it took me so many years to read Lord of the Rings <laughs> because of the first three pages. You know, you just, the amount of lineage that you're going through and what hobbits are and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And it was just, and you look at the rest of the book and you go, I'm not going to get through this. And you keep putting it down where when you got it as much smaller ideas, it gives you that ability. Oh, you know what? I'll get to, I, I can't read this word. I'll just make, I'll make up my own pronunciation for it. Mm. Nobody's ever going to know. And, I, and I, I can get to the end. And so, that's where when I, read it, I read it all the way through. Uh, and I got the thread of the story, you know, the, 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 let's say be, behind the, veneer of uh, you know of hairy feet and this that and the other. <laughs> uh, i've got the story because yeah. i read all you know pretty much all at the same time uh, i guess if you're putting it down and picking it up you know, oh god well i eventually did i i made when 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 jackson was bringing out the lord of the rings films i made yeah. it an absolute point that i was going to read it no matter what mm. um so and and being dyslexic it is very difficult to read oh, stuff like that god. at times yeah um because you don't know what half the words mean when you know how they're pronounced um yeah. but the so i made it through it and there are the and, I, and you know from a writing point of view it's it's really labored and stuff like that but the story is great the story mm. underneath, which is why i love the movies because the movies you do get the story going on oh kind of i thought i thought the movies oh god i mean just the thought yeah. of even, even making half of one of the movies is god almighty it's just yeah Oh, I'm, I'm having, having been in that filming environment for a long time. Oh, you know, I've got a story for you. I, oh. I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. So, oh. so Sir Ian McKellen comes into the green room at Coronation Street. Uh, there's only me sat there, and he comes in with the producer. So clearly the, he's, they've chatted it out, and the producer has um, fooled him, uh, no, um, <laughs> enticed him to come into the, the cast for a certain amount of time. So first time in the green room, sits next to me, the producer says, Sean, sorry, Ian McKellen, uh, uh, Ian, uh, Sean Wilson. So we're talking away and I'm saying, oh, well, you know, lovely to meet you. And uh, obviously you're going to come and work with us. What character are you playing? Blah, blah, blah. And all the time he was looking down at the table. Now, my character was really quite busy, so I could have like a tone of different scripts that I've put together that I need to cover in the next couple of weeks. And he kept looking at these scripts. So I said to him, uh, Ian, you keep looking down at the table. Is there something catching your eye or something? What, what's going on there? He said, what is that? So I said, I said, Ian, it, it's a script. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you are Sir Ian McKellen, famous actor. <laughs> met Queen a few times for, uh, for uh, badge reasons. Um, I said, so uh, uh, that's, that's my script. And he said, no way. And how long has you, have, have you got to get through that? I said, well, probably this week and a little bit of next week. And the look of fear in his face was real. So I said, what's the problem? He said, well, when we did The Lord of the Rings, we did about 12 lines a day. <laughs> so can you imagine how long it took them to get to? I mean, a great paid job. 12 lines a day, you're doing The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, it took them about three years, didn't it? Three or four years filming that. But 12 lines a day? He was genuinely frightened. Isn't that wow. amazing? That is, well, when you consider, I saw his one-man show. He came to Blackpool. He did a tour of the theatres where every penny from the ticket sales went to the theatre. He didn't take oh. any payment. He just did a tour to raise money. And he actually stood by the door on the way out collecting more money, you know, in the bucket. Wow. He, the second half of that show, he's, he's there. He's got all, he's basically played every single part in Shakespeare. Mm. in all the wow. Shakespeare productions over his career. Wow. Yeah. And he's got all the Shakespeare plays and he's asking people to, to name a character and then he was just doing a wow. monologue from them straight off the top of his head. And, wow, amazing. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I think he would probably prefer to play all the female parts. Ah. <laughs> I have, I have <laughs> one Ian McKellen story that was by proxies. A friend of mine called Matt, who's, he was, a, I call him the unluckiest actor. He actually had a speaking part opposite Oliver Reed in The Guardian, in The Gladiator. Wow. And then the day he was about to fly out, Oliver Reed died. So his part got completely cut because wow. of, of all that sort of thing going on. But yeah. he, he was outside a theatre in London 
and he was waiting for the actors to come out and he was stood there and my and matt is he's completely ripped he's you know he's not an ounce of fat on him he's always been this completely you know muscular guy so when the mm. sun is when the sun is out in london he walks around with no top on because that's his want he said he said he was stood there and then he sort of looked to one side and he realized that Sir Ian McKellen was stood next to him <laughs> and he looked at him and he said i just want to say I think you're absolutely brilliant. I think as an actor, you're amazing. And I look up to you. And apparently Ian McKellen just looked at him like that, looked him up and down and went, mm. and then walked off. <laughs> oh, my God. Like he, was looking at, like he was looking at a lemon meringue. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Right. They don't call I love that. Kind of thing. In the green room, he's out there. What's that? Because doesn't Ian McKellen do that in extras? There'll be no scripts on the night, people. Yeah, he does. He does that one, doesn't he? Right, yeah. So, Kaiki, you might have a thing about scripts. Well, um, you, would do if you, you would do if you only do 12 lines a day. <laughs> I saw him in King Lear, and um, it was it was uh, the RSC at Stratford-on-Avon, and he was playing Lear, and for the mad scene, um, to show that he's gone insane, he decided to um, strip off all his clothes. Um, he'd got a large part in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did, anybody did who was sat the balls up of it then. Um, anybody who was sat on the front row, that you could have had their eye out. It was just, it was really, yeah. Um. <laughs> well, if, if you got it, flaunt it, I guess. Yeah, but was it screaming? There's the thing. No, I, if I'd got one that size, I would have been flashing it back in. <laughs> That'd be a one, wouldn't it? That'd be a completely different story that we read. The screaming cock. You know. <laughs> yeah. God, <laughs> how funny! But uh, but wow. yes. Yeah. Sorry, I've just taken the tone right down. Oh, no, no, yeah. we wouldn't expect yeah. anything less, Ash. Yeah. Um, but I mean, to sit, to I mean, you must have sat next to some some people in that green room then, because they actually did get a few people through at one point, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Norman Wisdom, he, <laughs> he was, he well, yeah, but uh, he he was really, he was just beyond belief. You know, I, I went and sat down, and uh, he sits in the little area where we sat, which of course he didn't know. Uh, you know, so I, I think I just asked him if I could just uh, get my bag down the side of, the, you know, that kind of thing. You know, rearrange things a little bit. Uh, and he said, uh, "What are you doing?" So I said, well, "I'm just nice to meet you. My name's Sean. I believe you're Norman. Lovely to meet you. Blah blah blah." Uh, uh, so I'm just picking up my bag because I just need it, you know, for my work and things. And he said. Uh, who are you? Who just who are you? And I was like, whoa, uh, Norman. <laughs> whoa, God, I know. I said, well, you know, if you tuned into the show at all, which you might not do, I've been here for about twenty years. So, <laughs> yeah, he, he was a real letdown. Oh wow. Um, yeah, uh, well, Bernard Cribbins was good. Very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, one of us. Yeah, it's pro proper old musical as well, isn't he? Oh, yeah, he was great. Really good. So, yeah, a few people. A few people through. A few, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, way <laughs> to undersell it, Sean. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah, um, but uh, Serena was a good one. Serena? Serena. Yes. Oh, Serena. Sorry, I thought you meant Serena. I thought, do you have Serena Williams on? Where no, that? no. That, apparently, that's what they call him in showbiz. Serena. Oh, Serena. <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't know. I hope I bump I into him on the street one day. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we digress, but I think maybe this story is asking for a little digression. Well, I think that's all part. I mean, we, we one of the things we're here to do is talk about creativity, and actually, funny enough, I think what you mentioned about the story and what we can all agree on is it is something that should be performed. So I'm going to actually sit there and say that with that particular tangent, oh my God, I would love to hear Sir Ian McKellen read this story <laughs> because I think he would put those elements into it, probably get his cock out as well. We don't know. But the, <laughs> the, the put those elements into it that would really pull those parts across and that whole bit of talking to someone else and get that concept of the madness going across. I think that would be an amazing thing to hear. Yeah. I mean, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, uh, in acting terms, to try and to give that, uh, uh, you know, the pastiche, the front of the story, uh, but then to have that underlying 
part of the story where you're actually building the anxiety. That's the craft. So there's two, there's two or three different things that are going on at the same time. And, and that's where I think this misses slightly, actually, because we've read a lot of monologues. I've written monologues and we've we've read a lot of monologues. And this one, I think, just misses that little edge of quality that you mm. get from some of them where you do get the ability to just sit in their mind and mm. realise that's what's going on. The Yellow Wallpaper, for example, I think is a great example of a monologue. Mm where it, yes. you really are diving into it and getting that that essence out of it and the, the quality and the skill of the writer is completely there mm. but, but also one... but also with that one those the issues that were brought up throughout the yellow wallpaper were actually happening and are really, you saying that there was feel... no screaming skull <laughs> Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So 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 the, the last story, the the, um, the the skull was just complete fictitious fiction. Yes. Where yellow wallpaper, you know, we still feel guilt after the way that women have been treated over the centuries, you know, we still feel it, don't we? Yeah, I mean there's there's a certain element of that, but like I say, is I think it's I mean, I'm not it's 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 a published story. It's a well-respected story, The Screaming Skull. And as we said, it's, it's, if you read it out and, you know, you can get mm. more interaction going with it in that way mm. is, but there is an element of it, I think, um, where it is not, it does, doesn't have that quality edge that we've had from other pieces that yeah. we've seen at the time. And I think that is, it's not to denounce it completely. Um, I mean, I, from a creative point of view, I actually have to question where he got his idea from, I think, could be the line by hands or by teeth of an unknown assailant, you know, where because he says that twice in it. And when he says it at the mm -hmm. end in the newspaper article, I kind of get the feeling that he's read a newspaper article and seen that line, and that's what sparked his imagination off a little bit. Yeah, oh, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. So that sort of goes on. And it's a little bit, it does kind of, because of the repetition, it does kind of flow a little bit of kind of... Um, a flow of consciousness, you know, where you're just writing and writing and writing. Like we thought the, the fall of the House of Usher, you know, was a bit like that. Um, you know, in that it, 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 it doesn't feel like it's been written to any particular form. It's just mm. written it and it's just come out, you know, that stream of consciousness. Mm. And it I feels a little bit like that. Is. Yeah, I think that's what my issue with it is. I mean, I think there's the stream of consciousness thing, which I'm never a big lover of stream of consciousness just because I like form and I like structure. But also I think the form and structure in this is slightly flawed. So where you've got those opening parts where he's saying, look, if you're quiet, you can hear the sounds of the wind. Ooh, spooky in the background. And yeah, oh, follow me up the stairs. If he'd found some way of turning the final twist of the story so that it was interactive, so that... As a reader, I was responsible for this or I was about to be cursed by this. In that case, I would have gone, yeah, that's a good piece of storytelling. But mm. instead, he's just... I agree with that. Way. And yeah, it, I think it needed... It started off dragging me in and mm. then didn't follow through. And it's like Chekhov's gone, you know, it's sort of like there over the mantelpiece and no fuckers mm. fire. Mm. I think the only time it went three-dimensional for me was when I could feel his anxiety growing. Yeah, I could I, I could actually feel him thinking, you know, he's saying, "Oh, it doesn't bother me," but then, you know, uh, thirty seconds later, it clearly does bother him, and then, of course, it bothered me because he because of the juxtapose <laughs> going on. But it started off one or two dimensional. It went three dimensional, but it finished one dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The end of it. I mean, I agree with you. The bit when he actually starts to go and get the box, and even though it's to me, it was a little bit overexplained, it does start getting that bit frantic. Mm. at that point but there mm. is the middle bit when he's talking about uh what was his name tremor i think it is the 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 gardener and you know he starts just talking about him and it's almost like uh, it just it, it, it's just a whole unnecessary bit in the middle in a way and i know it's kind of there for repetition but it's like it, it was a little bit like it was like i say stream of consciousness he was just thinking about things or he was writing to an absolute word count and it's a bit padded like mm. I say, you, if you cut certain bits of that out, and I think you could, I think you could do an edit on that story without changing the words, tighten it up, and it become a really mm. quite exciting story, which I wonder mm. if people have done that in adaptations of it, you know, when they're doing mm. play adaptations. Yeah, I think, um, I think Ash's take on that, of making it so you, just by reading it, are, are, uh, are connected. Yeah. Now, just by reading it, you are now connected 
with uh, with what is just about to happen. Yes. You now that kind of thing. So and you become a... so you become part of the story, really, a little That's bit. It. And there's a bit in the middle where you're not connected to it at all because he then mm. starts talking about stuff that's almost irrelevant. Yeah, I did nod off on. for two or three minutes. Um, it was maybe then. Yeah, that's a bit when he finds the jaw in the line pit. It starts. That's the that was one of those weird bits where it kind of goes. There's a couple of moments where he starts revealing something, and it's not been mentioned before, and it's almost like he's just thought of it. Mm. And there's there's little moments like that all the way through it that mm. that you kind of get the impression that he hasn't really mapped out the entire story as he's written it. Mm. You know, he doesn't know where it's going, and it hasn't had an edit backwards on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, which can yeah. happen. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, but interesting. I, I found it really quite interesting from, you know, a few different angles. I think the story behind it is great. I really do. I think it, that the idea of that screaming skull and the murdered wife and is it her and the lead, you know, in the ear and this, the whole underpinning of it, I think, is absolutely fantastic. I want to watch the film, 1954, mm-hmm. which seems to be more famous than the actual story. Oh, yes, there is a film. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I forgot about that. So I, I, I'm going to go back and have a watch. I know I've seen it in the past, but I'm going to go back and have another watch of that. And it hasn't, it's not one of those ones where I'm kind of walking away from it going, oh my God, that was terrible. I can't believe we just read that. Mm. And it even doesn't feel like a missed trick. I mean, we've read stuff in the past where you read it and go, they just missed the chance to do something great here. Mm. I think it has all those elements, but it's a bit too bloated. Mm. For it to really pull it together on a, on a, on that scale, yeah, 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 I would agree. You know, I mean, you guys are used to editing things, and I, I guess things just like, you know, they're like bloody, you know, headlights coming down the road sometimes. See <laughs> you guys, but, but but that's the way that you work, so well, you I, see those things. There's one I'll always say that it can work both ways. When I was when when I was doing anagramophobia and um, Ash did the edit on it, I always remember this. It's it's, uh, it's one of the big lessons I learned in editing is he didn't tell me what to do. He just put a question in. And it was a point where I reveal something in the story. And he just put, do you want to reveal that here? And you suddenly look at it and go, no, it's too early. It's the wrong timing. And I ended up writing about another three or four pages to get the timing right. And it made it so much better because of it. And there are mm. times when you can sit there and say, is this necessary? That's oh, all yeah, it is. Yeah, is this yeah. necessary? Uh, I oh, think get what, rid of it. Yeah, I think <laughs> what you're saying is it's difficult to edit your own work, but easier to edit other people's. Yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one I'm working on at the moment. Um, no, it's just all over the place. I've written this backwards, practically. Um, well, not even backwards. I've written the end, which I thought was the start, and then written a bit that's sort of like near the start, but not quite the start, and then gone that way, <laughs> that way, and been avoiding the penultimate bit. So I've gone back to the bit before. Yeah, I'm, yeah, this is I mean, such a serious edit before it's anywhere near. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But, whereas I, I used to love films that started at the end. They don't do it anymore. Yeah? So you, yeah. you, you see a film and you think, but I was I was I was onto it fairly soon. I was quite young, and I'd say to my grandma, uh, "This is the end of the film, so we're g- the the rest of the film now is going to explain why that's the end." You don't really yeah. see uh, many films like that anymore, do you? No, there was that one about monkeys with Bruce Willis. Um, was it thirteen? Twelve mon- monkeys. Oh yeah, twelve monkeys. Yeah. 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 yeah um, it was. Pulp Fiction did it something similar to that, where you've got, yeah where you've got John Travolta gets killed halfway through, but he's still alive to walk away at the end of it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's not technically backwards, but it's jumbled around so that it's mm. more... Interview with the mm. Vampire does that. Yeah. But not I'm in not a back- clever way. It's more of a flashback movie rather than being... No, Sometimes you, yeah. you get them where you suddenly realise that you're coming back up on itself. You know, they're, mm. they're the ones I like. I guess, I, got- uh, I guess if it happens at all, at all, it will happen more in fiction. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe you've got one of those on your hands, Ash. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind that actually. Um, and even if I haven't, that might be what I work on next because uh, mm. I know what you mean. The good. It's one of the reasons why I always love watching Columbo. Um, you know what's happened. You just sort of like watching the process of how it goes to who's done it, well, mm. how's done it. Yeah. Mm. Well, basically, it is, isn't it? 
Yeah. So yeah. what are we reading next week? Uh, it's not my choice. I did the random one. Oh, don't, don't. You can't put it on me. I'm too busy. <laughs> In that case, we've had... We've had um, one of our viewers has um, yes. mentioned that we've not been looking at certain authors, so I... Find um, one of those, Ash. Find one of those. Um, such as Algernon Blackwood is one of the people that he mentioned, and I thought um, The Wood of the Dead. Um, mm. because it's, okay, um, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, well, it's good that it's suggested by, you know, somebody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're yes, all in favour of that. Him, it's, um, yeah, if he's screwed up. If you are uh, one of the two listening to this... <laughs> Yeah, and please come and give us more suggestions because we love them. The Wood um, of the Dead. The Wood of the somebody dead. else mentioned the yellow wallpaper, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yes, it was. Yes. It was one of those I would said that I hadn't read it, and then someone got annoyed at the fact that I hadn't read it. Oh, that was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah good. All right. Yeah. Well, the Wood um, of the Dead. That has oh god, because you can read. That's almost carry on, isn't it? Wood of the Dead by <laughs> Algernon Black. <laughs> uh, well, has anyone done the stiffy joke yet? Right. Um, well, no, <coughs> what I will say is, um, yeah, sure, it's about half an hour on YouTube. Right, great. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm not that busy, but even so, yeah, uh, every waking hour is on this. On, I nearly called it the bloody book. It's the first time I've called it the bloody book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, uh, I can assure the listeners and viewers that uh, when it does come out, it is going to be a fantastic book because I've done yeah. quite enjoyed reading. I'm hoping so. We, we all hope so, don't we? No, yeah, of course it. you do. But I mean, it, it, yeah. it's an enjoyable read, the bits I've read of it. And, for, and the photographs I've seen of the food look even more enjoyable. Oh, mm. Just, yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, I'll yeah. send you some of the photos we, we had done this week, Ash. You'll enjoy them. A bit of lateral <laughs> thinking going. No, there's a bit of lateral thinking going on. Yeah, I did like him. I like the, the iron. That was my favourite one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. The photographer, oh, anyway, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that has been absolutely fantastic. So we're going to read The Wood of the Dead, um, sum it up on this one. It's creative ideas, misses the trick a little bit, but it's actually, I'm going to say, it's still worth a read. Um, and I, and do it as a read out to other people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, listen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, but as long as you can find a good one and not the ones that I found. God, my mm. God's sake! You know, there's oh, let's find as many people as possible without a personality and get them to read. Them. <laughs> That's the ones that I found. Mm. Um, but yeah, so yeah, do go and find it because it's very very good. And I'll see you guys next week. See you all next okay. week. Okay. Okay. Bon chance. Yes. Bye. Bon chance. Thank you.